Hello, and welcome to episode 312 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Perrin, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Attack Submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore of Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor, and many other postings. How are you this dreary November day in Mississippi anyway, Bill? It's dreary here in Florida as well, Seth. We got a very somber topic to talk about today, but I can't help but but share with you that I started the morning with a belly laugh from one of our uh, intrepid viewers who commented because the day we're recording this, this morning we released our episode, the second episode on the USS Enter Enterprise. And in the opening that one, I think I mentioned something about how most of our commenters are very constructive, but every now and then somebody wants to prove how much they know about Baleo class bilge pumps, and they'll <laughs> make a comment about that. And so we got a comment this morning from the president of the Baleo class, class bilge pump experts association, who was pretty upset about the fact that I was criticizing folks who proclaimed expertise on Baleo class bilge pumps. It was hilarious. And I'm so glad we have a you know view, group of viewers with the right perspective because today they're going to need it, Seth. Yes. You ain't kidding. And and if you're watching, you see the third member of our crew here. Uh, we always are happy to have him, and he's been with us regularly here, regularly here the last few weeks. And uh, we welcome him back again this week, John Parshall. How are you this fine morning? I'm well. Yeah, you can see the the glare, you know, reflecting off the forehead here. You know, it's me. So <laughs> I don't know, man. I got a little bit of a shine going on. Up here, <laughs> no, no, <so>. no. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to make you feel better. We're good. We're good. Absolutely. <clears throat> All right. Well, uh, before we get started, as always, we want to like we want to remind you to like and remind. Oh, Jesus, good God! Let's try this again. It's been a morning, fellas. It's been a morning. We want to ask you to like and subscribe to our channel because we do appreciate that. It helps other people find our material. So if you haven't done so, please do so. And if you have, thanks. So, in our previous episode, the campaign on Saipan had turned a corner, or so it felt. 27th Infantry Division had come ashore and run into a brick wall in the form of honeycomb caves and defensive positions at Nafton Point. Major Marine General Holland M. Smith, cognizant of the slow progress of the operation and high casualties thus far sustained, and cognizant of little else, had thrust the Army's 27th Infantry Division right smack in the middle of the line. The area that the 27th occupied was some of the worst, if not the worst, terrain on the entire island. The valley that the 27th was to advance through, aptly named Death Valley, and its accompanying ridgeline, equally aptly named Purple Heart Ridge, proved to be probably the toughest nut to crack in the entire Saipan operation. The failure of the 27th to take the positions, accompanied by the failure of the commanding general to seize the problem and fix it, all left Holland Smith with no other option than to relieve Ralph Smith. Finally, given the artillery support they needed, why before? I don't know. And the leadership they really needed, the dog faces pushed through and around the valley, and the offensive resumed at a rapid pace. By July the 7th, the Marines and Army believed that Saipan, the Saipan operation was to be well in hand. At least that's what they thought. The Japanese had other plans. The Japanese attack on the night of July 7th, 1944, would become one of the most terrifying nights in probably the entire Pacific War. And that's saying something. The Gyokasai, the final Japanese martial act on Saipan, would unleash hell and abject terror on the already worn out 105th Infantry Regiment. The Gyokasai would be a fitting end for this, the war's bloodiest campaign to date. Except that it wasn't. Following the Gyokasai, Saipan, already stained by the deaths of thousands of Japanese and American military, would be stained further by the blood of the innocent. And would see a horror the likes of which Americans could never have possibly contemplated before even in their most horrifying nightmares. Gentlemen, with that uplifting introduction. <laughs> yes, it is, isn't it? You know, and and we started to say this when uh, before we recorded. There's so much death and destruction that you can take as you're going through this stuff. And it this this is a very difficult it was a very difficult one to research and write. And this is going to be equally difficult, I think, for us to get through. Because yeah. it just sucks. There's like there's there's a there's several uplifting stories in it, but they're surrounded by so much mess Badness. it's it's yeah, yeah yeah it's 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 bad bad stuff so let's um let's give a situation report let's give a sit rep as it was uh on the evening of july 7th 1944 
Uh, as the American advance had continued northwards, the 2nd Marine Division got kind of pinched out of the line. The natural contours of the island squeezed them out. They were on the other on, on the eastern shore and they were or western shore rather, and they were pushed out of, of the advance as it continued. Uh, Bill's going to pull up a map right here and you can see it pretty clearly on there. Bill, can you uh, can you demonstrate it for us where we're to? There we go. Yeah, the the second Marine Division was, as you said, on the western side, and here's where they get side. pinched out right around here, Seth. The fourth Marine Division, of course, is on the eastern side, and then the uh, dog faces are going down Death Valley in that direction. So that's kind of the way this is laying out at this point in time. Mm -hmm. So the, as a second division is pushed out, the twenty seventh and the fourth are now taking the vanguard they've they've got the front end of the push here uh on july the 6th highland smith told G uh, army general griner that the fourth marine division who was making faster progress against crumbling resistance would continue north alone uh, allowing the 27th to hold their line after pushing a further 2500 yards towards a coastal pocket of defenders ahead the, ahead of them now this is all setting up for this one big morass that's about to unfold here um the 27th sector in advance in this sector specifically, like all other 27's actions was slow and moved at a snail's pace. That being said, they did get up to their final line. There was a gentleman who's by the name of Colonel William J. O.B. O'Brien. You're going to hear a lot about him today. He was commanding officer of first of 105. He had placed his unit in position about an hour after dark. Originally, they were supposed to dig in between the railway that ran along the coast and the shore. O'Brien, however, was unhappy with the position, saying that it limited my field of fire, quote, unquote. After discussion, he moved his people to the right of the rail line, attempting to tie in with Major McCarthy's first of 105. Now, John, you've been to this particular battlefield or, well, I mean, it's all a battlefield, but you've been to this particular spot on the battlefield. I know I have to. Yeah, it's it's a pretty wide open. I mean, it, it does have some terrain features, but by and large, it's a fairly wide open expanse here, is it? Yeah, not? it is. In fact, you know, the site of this attack is about about a half a mile south of the hotel that we typically take our guests to and we're touring here. And yes, um, you do still have the ridge line in the center of the island that is sort of Mount Topachow as it is sloping down towards, you know, its final terminus up north. Um, but yes, it's a it's a fairly wide open uh, plain. It does have you know your typical tropical undergrowth and that kind of thing. But uh, for Obi to be saying that his field of fire is limited here seems somewhat odd to me. I got to say, yeah, because of, because of the openness of that terrain, I don't. I admit, I, I agree with you one hundred percent. I don't really understand why he said his field of fire was limited. Yeah regardless of this he does and he does move his people over and i think that's that's an area a legitimate area to question as the battle is going to unfold here but as as we'll see i don't really think it would have mattered if right. he had stayed where he was to be honest with you yeah. seth wasn't he worried about being constrained again if i go to the map here by there's a rail line right that runs up here and mm -hmm. and wasn't some of his guidance to stay to the west of that rail line which which would you know could have impeded his movement some. Uh, basically, they're saying they want him on pretty close to the beach, and he is sidestepping right. in inland a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, again, not exactly sure why. Yeah, yeah, don't understand. And what 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 it amounts to, what happens here is because he moves his unit to the area in which he moves his unit, there was a gap in the in between the lines here and it's not just a small gap it's about 500 yards wide it's a big ass gap yeah. uh, o'brien immediately recognizes this admittedly so and knowing he was short on men now you got to remember the 105th had taken a beating they'd take they'd taken a beating up in nafton they'd taken a beating up through death valley these guys were worn out they were short on trigger pullers they were short on infantrymen Knowing he was short on men, he decided to position some of his anti-tank guns, which were 37 millimeters, and heavy machine guns in that area to cover that gap. Now, a 500-yard gap covered by 37 millimeters and, you know, one would assume 1917 water-cooled machine guns and 1919-84s is, is, you know, fairly, fairly well covered. But 500 yards is still a big area, a big and gap. when you get a herd of people coming through there. Right. Yeah. And, you know, even with the underbrush, uh, yeah, that, it, that's it's problematic trying to cover that with just heavy weapons and, and some artillery. So, 
Yeah. And speaking of artillery, uh, also yes. arriving later in that evening were some 105 millimeter artillery pieces belonging to the 10th Marines. Belonging to the 2nd Marine Division, these men and their weapons were sent forward to provide artillery support for the 4th Marine Division as they continued the push northwards. As they sat, the weapons were about 1,200 yards behind O'Brien and McCarthy's forward front uh, defensive lines. Um, what the artillerymen did not know, however, was that they and their guns sat directly in the center of the undefended gap between O'Brien and McCarthy. So they were literally in the worst possible place for them to be. Yeah, and this is an instance of poor inter-service communications where the commander of an army infantry battalion is not telling the Marine uh, artillery battalion behind him that, oh, by the way, you're sitting right in the middle of a void space. Yeah, and that, that's what I was going to ask you, because I was unable to find any kind of any kind of communication between these two units. Doesn't seem like there was. Yeah. Yeah, at, at all. I don't even think that the Army, I don't even think O'Brien knew that the Marines were back there. Like, yeah, they could all. be. Right. Yeah. I, because I couldn't find any kind of record of any kind of communication between the two units at all yeah. through this entire evening. So as far as the Americans are concerned, guys, the, the front is stable. You know, the, 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 it is stable. The, the It is secure. There is no reason to believe that the Japanese are massing for any kind of final assault. Quite the opposite, actually. Uh, Intel had said, which, we, as we've said before on Saipan, American Intel was just abysmally bad it, it was really really bad intel had said that you know the japanese were done that that, yeah. that they had no offensive capability that they were smoked they were done and 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 given the smoked. way that that everybody's been pushing forward particularly the marines you know it, it would seem that that makes sense that Really, with the capture of Death Valley, uh, Saito's army has been decisively broken at this point. And, you know, there's just increasing numbers of, of wounded troops that they really are a shell of, of the original force. And so, yes, they are beaten. Uh, but that does that intel on our side does not take into account what the Japanese typically do when cornered. Which, of course, is. Yeah, launch human wave attacks. So right. there were there were indications that something was amiss, and and even a, a couple of days before the the actual Japanese final charge, there there were indications that something was going on. There were prisoners of war that were taken, and we've talked about you know in the past that there there weren't too many prisoners of war taken at ever, and I believe the last episode we ended with like 127 prisoners of war. Had been taken, or 172, or something like that. It's just a laughably small number when you when you get right down to mm -hmm. it. It is, it is. But but the few that are being captured here in the days leading up and the day of the attack, straight up tell their American captors that, yeah, something's coming, and right. and, and and this is not going to be just some you know pittance of an attack. There's a lot of guys that are being massed up here around Marpy Point, and they're going to come, and they're going to come on the night of July 7th. I mean, they even tell them exactly what time they're theoretically going to launch the assault. So, I mean, it's... it's Yeah. And, and and this is interesting, too, because this is fairly typical behavior. Uh, when we did manage to capture Japanese troops, they were typically very forthcoming with information, and, you know, you didn't really have to wring it out of them as to what was what was going on. And a lot of that was due to the fact that, you know, Having been captured, they realized or they felt that their lives were essentially over in any case. You know, I've I've committed the ultimate disgrace by being captured. And so they were not uh, particularly truculent when it came to, you know, being willing to cough up information. And yes, we've got a couple of prisoners who have said, you know, we've received orders from General Saito to make a final attack. And, you know, so this is this is in the American hands. You know, it was specifically at 20 hundred that night, which, you know, right. although that's wonderful intel, when it doesn't happen at 20 hundred, the Americans say, oh, well, it was he was making it up. It's not going right. to happen. It was right. actually negative intel. Right. Exactly. And of course, you know, given the difficulties that the 27th has had in getting its attacks, uh, you know, launched on time, you you might think that that gee the japanese having been you know shellacked with the firepower we've been throwing at them for the last three weeks might be in a similar state but there you have it yeah yeah, yeah. 
So it gets very specific here. On the 4th of July, Independence Day, a Japanese civilian had been captured and told the GIs that a mass assault was planned for July the 7th. This gentleman is, as you said, John, he's spilling the beans. He's saying yeah. everything that he knows, and he's laying everything out there. The information is related to the 27th Infantry Division's intelligence officer, or Colonel Van Antwerp. Uh, Lieutenant Benjamin Hazard, the original interrogator of this Japanese gentleman, was told that his information was, quote, nonsense, unquote. Sticking to his guns, Hazard pressed the issue. Further interrogation of this 55th Naval Guard prisoner of war revealed that the Japanese were to mass men and anyone who could walk was to carry a weapon and attack. 27th had taken note of Japanese seeming to mass near Makushna, passed the information to Holland Smith's headquarters, who later said that the units in the area, 105th, should prepare for an assault, yet it is unlikely that one will occur. Again, this is the whole intelligence issue with the Marines and, and Holland Smith on this island. It's, it's atrocious. Holland Smith's intel officer said, and I quote, the army is excited. 27th Division G2 has called me several times saying Japs are massing around Makushna, unquote. Mm. If somebody's telling you that. Right. But, you know, uh, you got to say that some of the uh, inner service prejudice that Holland Smith has, yes. has filtered down to his staff and they do not hold the the. Uh, the 27th ID in much respect at this point, and certainly not the 105th Infantry Regiment. And so, yeah, people are people have confirmation bias. Let's just put it that way, and they're not listening to the information that they're getting. Yeah, no, 100% agree. Uh, Hazard continues to relay this new information to Van Antwerp, who now believes the situation, and he says, "unquote or quote the roof was about to fall in." Unquote. Yeah. Now, whether he said that then or he said that 50 years after the fact, I do not know. Right. But the roof indeed was about, was about to, to fall, fall in. in. Mm -hmm. So, John, can you enlighten us on the Japanese situation here as, as we're looking at this? Yeah, absolutely. It's disastrous. Um, you know, as I said earlier, Saito's army has been shattered as a result of the defensive fighting that they've been doing for the past uh, few weeks. They are down to, you know, four or five thousand effectives at this point, uh, many of whom are uh, wounded. They are very short of ammunition. Uh, the field hospitals are no longer able to, you know, do anything because they're running out of supplies and medical uh, medical supplies as well. And not only that, they are, you know, they're also intermingled and saddled with the the remainder of the civilian population that has likewise been pushed into the north part of uh part of this island and there's no place to hide anymore really uh there's no place to go you know we're just all crammed into this little pocket that's just a couple miles long and the americans are pounding it with artillery constantly so it's just it's just a nightmare um saito then uh makes his final sets of communiques back to tokyo that um you know, it's game over and we will be launching a final attack against the Americans on July 7th. He then uh, is uh, going to go about, actually, he's going to commit suicide before the attack ever goes in, which to me is just yeah. <laughs> great leadership. And you got to understand, too, that Saito is never seen um, by the majority of the Japanese army as, as a particularly effective general. This guy was definitely second or third tier. So, um, yeah, he's he's not an A player and he's not going to lead his troops from the fore. He's basically going to kill himself and tell his men, you, you carry on without me, have fun. Uh, he also, though, makes the decision to put any able-bodied civilians into this attack as well, even if they are completely unarmed uh, or have nothing more than bamboo poles or, or sharpened sticks or what have you. So here is sort of the first instance, if you will, of the Japanese military making this intersection with the civilian population and erasing the distinction between civilian and soldiers and saying any able-bodied person you're now a soldier. Now, what I was going to say is you know, he, he charged all, all of his troops to kill 10 Americans before they were allowed to die each. Right. And by killing himself, I guess, those 10 Americans who otherwise were allowed to live. I mean, I, this is, you know, you, it's hard to understand. A lot of what the Japanese do during this war is hard to understand. But this is even 
even within the taxonomy of their own set of logic. Right. This is hard to understand. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Not great leadership by by General Saito. And yes, I, I'm always amused uh, to see, you know, these exhortations of you have to kill 10 Americans, uh, you know, before you die yourself. Like that has not been working uh, uh, throughout the campaign. But, you know, here here are your yeah. marching orders. They're running out of weapons. They don't have, you know, even enough small arms at this point to uh, equip all of the soldiers that they have. And so they're reduced to expedience, like, as I say, sharpened sticks or finding a bayonet and, and wrapping that to a pole or a stick or something of that nature to put some sort of cutting implement into the hands of, of all of these Poor people who are going to be, you know, charging into massed American firepower on the evening of July 7th. Yeah. And Didn't to, the Americans to your call point, these things okay. idiot sticks? Idiot, idiot sticks. sticks. Something like yeah. that. Right. Yeah. 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 To, to your point exactly, John, about Saito and his uh, opinions of the civilian population on Saipan, reportedly, a major Hirokushi who was. In Saito's headquarters uh, reported that Saito supposedly said, quote, there is no longer any distinction between civilians and troops. It would be better for them to join in the attack with bamboo spears than be captured. Write right. out instructions to that effect, end quote. Yes. So and he makes it, immediate, makes it yeah. crystal clear and then distributes 300 copies of these orders throughout, you know, the, the masses of both civilians and soldiers that you know, this is what's going down. So the Gyokusai, as it was called, is called, uh, roughly translates to breaking the pearl. I had never heard of this before, but apparently it is a thing in the Imperial Japanese Army even before World War II that these... Yeah, you know, it, it, shattering the gem is also another translation for it. But yes, mm -hmm. that's exactly right. That we're basically, we're going out with a bang. Um, yeah. And... The, the Japanese construct this whole sort of poetical set of aphorisms around mass suicide to make it seem as if it is glorious and beautiful and, you know, cherry blossoms falling through the wind and blah, 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 when in actuality it is just going to be mass death and carnage on a humongous scale. It's madness. It's it's absolute yeah. madness. Mm -hmm. So Saito's final order, in part, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, reads like this, quote, For more than 20 days since the American devils attacked the officers, men, and the civilian employees of the Imperial Army and Navy on this island have fought well and bravely. Now we have no material with which to fight, and our artillery for attack has been completely destroyed. Whether we attack or stay where we are, there is only death. I will advance, no, we won't, with those who remain to deliver, but still another blow, to the American devils and leave my bones on Saipan as a bulwark, bulwark of the Pacific. I will never suffer the disgrace of being taken alive, and I will offer up the courage of my soul and calmly rejoice in living by the eternal principle. Here I pray with you for the eternal life of the emperor and welfare of the country, and I advance to seek out the enemy, unquote. So he makes it very, very clear in no uncertain terms that if you're breathing and you can move, you're going to die and you're going to run yourself smack into the American positions and that's just the way it's going to go. That's that's the way it's going to go down. So, yeah. you know, the the strange thing is, and there are survivors of this attack too. And we'll get to the attack here in just a few minutes. And there are survivors of, of this attack, but there were not a lot of people who said, "You know what? This is foolishness. I am not going to do this." Right. And well, and over you, yeah. And, th and this is the product of decades worth of indoctrination uh, on the part of you know. As I say, starting at school age, uh, particularly if you're a male in Japan society, you have been militarized through the school system since since early childhood. And so, yeah, it is seen as as a disgrace to be captured. And the only thing you can do is uh, is die gloriously for the emperor. That's the only choice you've got in the matter. So, no, there are not a lot of voices of reason saying this is stupid. Um, that would be seen as as disgraceful and and impertinent. Yeah. Of course, as the war progresses, the girls are trained to do this as well, and yeah. middle school girls. Yeah. So. Yeah. It 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 just further spirals out of control, and I'm talking about the war, not just here. Although this is the mm -hmm. probably the first major evidence of the 
madness that is going to continue to occur here. Yeah. Um, this this is I pulled this out of a out of a out of a book here. A survivor of the Gyokusai admitted to his American captors that his unit had only 113 effective attackers. A further 107 had killed themselves before the attack was ever launched. Now, yeah. obviously, we don't know how severely wounded these guys were. I mean, I'm sure right. some of them were probably really bad off. But again, no surrender. You know, absolutely no, no surrender. surrender. Yeah. If, anyway, whatever. So, command of the Gyokusai fell to a Colonel Suzuki. And those who will remember the first episode of this trio from Saipan will probably recognize that name. Suzuki was the guy that was with Colonel Goto when they launched the mass, uh, not mass, the uh, combined arms infantry and armor assault on the beachhead and very, very early in the campaign. So there were so many attackers that the column reportedly stretched from Makushna to Marpy Point. And John, that didn't build. Can, I don't know. Can you pull up? Yeah. Uh, is Makushna on your map? Yeah, that's yeah. that's a couple three miles, and I I find that um, dubious. Dubious. Thank you. Yes, incredible. Uh, I I do grant that you know given the the conditions of artillery fire that have been prevalent during daylight hours, you know you're certainly not going to be massing during the daylight, and so sure, once things settle down for the evening, there are going to be a lot of Japanese people crawling out of whatever holes they're hiding in and making their way um towards the uh the assembly point of kushna but uh i i certainly can't imagine that it was a solid column of people stretching all the way back for three miles that that just kind of doesn't doesn't jibe with me i could see groups stretching for three miles but not right. a solid long yeah you know, i could yeah, see I'll, a pocket here or a pocket there or a pocket yeah i'll here. buy that right yeah, for anyway. sure yeah but yeah. a whole s string of people three miles long i don't yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is they're going to mass, you know, over 4,000 people here, pro probably pretty close to 5,000. And that's, you know, that's that's a lot of people. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Suzuki, as we just said, he's an experienced commander. I mean, this guy's an infantry commander. He, he theoretically knows what he's doing. Uh, and he, as such, before this attack is launched, he does what most infantry commanders do. They send out probes to find weak spots in the American lines. And lo and behold... They find that enormous 500 yard gap that has been left mm. there. Yeah, and, you know, we should just it's difficult in the in the face of events like this for us as Americans not to look at the Japanese and just say these people are just completely incompetent. You know what is going on here? But we need to remember that at a tactical level and certainly at a field craft level, the Japanese army is one of the best armies in the world when it comes to actually moving through difficult terrain. And yes using probes particularly at night they are extremely proficient at night combat they do this all the time and so suzuki and the men underneath him as wounded and beaten up as they are have got the skill set to you know do those sort of probing actions and figure out there's a gap here you know we're not getting any fire when we try to push through this particular chunk of terrain and suzuki being nobody's fool uh says well <laughs> that's where we're going then mm -hmm. Because at, at the end of the right. day, to your point, they're still an army. Yeah. They're still an yeah, army. Yeah, the problem, though, Seth, is that there, there's no units. The command and control has completely yeah. broken sure. apart. Yeah. So you can't say, you know, Foxtrot Company, you, you assault from this position. It's just that it's melee times right. a thousand. And so, you know, the coordination is lacking, and it's just throw people as fodder into the cannon, and that's all you're really doing here. So all of the wonderful organizational, you know, fire and maneuver methods that they could use in field craft that John was talking about are kind of irrelevant here, aren't they? Well, he's still got enough effectives in this organized mob that he's got to at least be able to put out orders to say, okay, you know, you, you, you 50 gentlemen, I want you to sneak <laughs> forward and see if you can find us a route forward. No, you're absolutely right that the, the unit integrity at this point is long since gone. But there are right. plenty of Japanese soldiers that still know their basic field craft enough that he can, you know, dispatch some of them on their way. And that's what ends up mm -hmm. happening. Yeah. And it helps that they're not worried about protecting those civilians because they're just extra fodder. And so, right. you know, from that standpoint, the distraction is gone. Right. Exactly. 
So as the to 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 set the stage, if the, as if this is not bad enough, it's pouring down rain on the American positions. It's darker than three feet down a cow's throat, and and there's not a whole lot that can be seen. You never heard that one before. No, <laughs> always <laughs> learning. Uh, Thanks yeah, for that. Uh, that's an old one for me, but that's you know. Yeah, regardless. Harder I used to hang out with woodpecker lips. Yes, exactly. harder than woodpecker lips. Yeah. Tougher than a two dollar steak. I used to hang out with ninety year olds. Remember that? So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, at the front in in the second uh, battalion, one hundred and fifth CP, Sergeant Ronald Johnson began to take notice of what seemed to be figures running in the gap between his second battalion and the neighboring first battalion, one hundred fifth. Men in the forward OPs reported hearing a buzzing sound that grew louder by the minute. God knows what the hell that is. And in it, in it quote says, it sounded like an enormous beehive. It kept getting louder and louder. Then it began to sound like some sort of a chant, unquote. I was going to say, it's people's voices. I mean, the civilians don't have any field craft. They don't know how to, you know, sneak forward silently at night. There's a lot of chatter going on, you know, God damn, I stubbed my toe again, you know, just all that yeah. kind of stuff. It's tough to keep 5,000 people quiet. Mm hmm. The uh, the Japanese had been gathering quite literally all night long, and, and and intermittent American artillery fire had, for whatever reason, they you know they're going to die anyway. But they decided to withhold their attack for several hours. It wasn't until 0400, 0400 ish that they launched this massive that they began to launch this massive assault around 0430. Small arms and machine gun fire started opening up along the line. You know, it, when you go back and you look at some of these other, and I, 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 I'm hesitant to call it a bonsai charge because that's so stereotypical Westernized crap. Right. But I mean, I don't know what else to call it. The Gyokusai, but I mean, most people don't, you know, whatever. It is what it is. The mass human wave assault. You know, when you think about these things occurring in the Pacific, they most of them occur at night. You know, I, like you said, John, these are skilled night fighters. They, they've trained for this kind of thing. Most of these things occur at night, but this is a last gasp. This occurs right before dawn. I mean, it certainly is darkness, but I mean, they're, they're, it, it, it's not long before you know, yeah. Mother Nature's sun rises up and, and, and the whole world can see what's going on here pretty quick. Right. As dawn begins to break, the Japanese come at us. And, and I mean, they are coming at us. Quote, they were running at us in groups screaming at the top of their lungs, unquote. Artillery fire, American artillery fire, one would assume that this is the 10th Marines, are dropping rounds in as the Japanese are coming through here, but it simply was not enough. You mentioned 4,000 guys, and there's estimates that range higher than that, John. Four or 5,000 people literally won't running maybe not as one, but certainly in waves and waves. And I mean, unless you got artillery, you know, part you know wheel to wheel yeah you're not stopping that you're not stopping yeah. that at all yeah that's exactly the problem you know they can't fire fast enough and of course they have their own problems and then for all that there's poor communication with the uh, you know the army troops to their four they they have to be cognizant of the fact that they can't drop their fire too close or they're going to you know you know rack up friendly fire kills in a massive way and so there's only so much that artillery can do to break this attack up once it gets going it's it's completely insufficient and you know as as we're going to see once this thing gets going and i say it it's a human wave because it is it's a wave and, and i mean you know waves build in intensity and this is kind of the same kind of thing and, and there's really not much that's going to stop it as we'll see what few survivors so the japanese are just they slam right into the 105th forward lines and they blow through them like crazy. I mean, just right through them. What few survivors there are in the forward OP said that, quote, there were so many of them all at once that we couldn't shoot fast enough. As dawn broke, there were so many people. It looked like a circus had just let out, unquote. That, yeah, that, that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of human beings running. That's at a you lot of time. human beings. Yeah, and so they, as you say, they can't they can't shoot fast enough, and the, the result is that the Japanese just blow past the initial mm -hmm. set of American lines and just keep right on going. Um, and there's hand to hand combat that devolves as a result of that. Uh, you know, as these isolated pockets of Americans are being wiped out by follow on waves of the Japanese, it's it's a hot mess. Yeah, some of these quotes that I'm going to read. It, 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 go ahead, Bill. No, so I'm just saying. Imagine. 
seeing this wave come at you and then you realize wait a minute there are children yes. in this way there are Do women and children right yeah i mean they're coming at you with pitchforks and you know yeah shovels and whatever they have these stupid sticks the bamboo poles you know what do you do? I mean, I yeah. had have they ever encountered a situation like this in the war before this? No American soldier has ever seen anything like this. This is a complete right. eye opener because yes, yeah, Saipan is the first place that we've ever run into large groups of, of Japanese civilians before. And yeah, this is completely outside the experience set of of any of the American soldiers that are in those two infantry battalions. It's just you got to be kidding me. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like something from a horror movie. Right. Bill, to, to your exact point, uh, one survivor, PFC Sam DeNova, said, quote, you could see women, kids, soldiers. They had bamboo poles with bayonets on them, shovels, pitchforks. They had everything. There were civilians with the soldiers, too. There were so damn many of them. Everybody was screaming and hollering. I didn't know what the hell was going on. Kids hollering, women screaming, machine guns firing, rifles firing. Unbelievable, unquote. Bedlam. Yeah, it's just absolute bedlam. Major McCarthy, who we mentioned just a little while ago, of the first of 105, later compared the human wave to a cattle stampede from a Western movie. He said, quote, it reminded me of one of those old cattle stampede scenes of the movies. The camera is in a hole in the ground and you see the herd coming and they leap up and over you and are gone. Only the Japs just kept coming and coming. I didn't think they'd ever stop. It didn't make any difference. If you shot one, five more would take his place. They ran right over us, unquote. And this is the first instance in this war where you've really had, you know, multiple American infantry battalions being just utterly overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, typically, uh, our firepower has been sufficient that we can take care of ourselves in these situations, but not here. Yeah, and that's, that's exa many people. exactly what I was going to say is that despite the fact that we had, you know, numerous machine guns and not just you know browning eric we had ma deuce we had 50 cals on the line too in, in certain spots it didn't matter there were yeah. jeeps with 50 calibers on the back of them there were 37 millimeters that were rolling canister shot into these people it did not matter there were that many human beings the firepower advantage that we possess in almost every single battle in the pacific and europe is completely negated here completely yeah. negated yeah, yeah, by the speed and, and the size of the assault. Again, once the Japanese make it past your initial, you know, line of resistance and are into your rear, now you've got, you know, the problem of trying to bring that firepower to bear in ways that you may be pointing it at your at your fellow soldiers further on in the back, you know. And yeah, it's 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 a disaster from a tactical standpoint. Absolutely. But as always, whenever any kind of situation like this unfolds, there was conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity. Bill, tell us about Obi O'Brien that we mentioned earlier. Well, you know, he struggled to maintain some sort of control as, as his perimeter dissolved, and the Japanese overran his positions for the rear. And what the Japanese would do is they would just kill the wounded, <laughs> you know, so there was a lot of wounded to begin with. They would overrun, they would create wounded, and then they would go back and kill the wounded. Stalking the line with the 1911 in each hand, Obi encouraged his men occasionally stopping to take shots at Japanese as they ran by him. He was shot in the back, but refused to be treated. Dropping to one knee, he continued firing, yelling at his men, don't give them one damned inch. Seth, this is incredible. And, you know, it doesn't end there. He's a bad man. Yeah. Uh, he's a bad dude. His, uh, his radio men sent word to the rear for help, <laughs> but it was already too late. The Gyokasai had literally swept by him. They had just blown right through him. Like, like, no, no. There's, yeah. there's, there's inappropriate ways to say it, but it's, let's just suffice it to say. aphorism it. here. Yes. Yeah. They've, mm -hmm. they've, they've moved. Uh, O'Brien realized that there was absolutely no hope at this point. He ordered his staff sergeant to form a new line 100 yards to the rear. This is called the second defensive line of the 105th here. As his sergeant, Charles Stefani, followed the order, he turned around to see O'Brien manning a 50 caliber machine gun on an abandoned Jeep firing away at the Japanese. When his body was found, there were over 30 dead Japanese surrounding his final position. Who knows how many of those men he killed regardless of this. O'Brien is awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously. And I mean, that is literally one of the one of those acts that you 
read about that you're like, wow, damn. Yeah. But that, unlike Saito, that is a leader of men. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. One of my favorite stories uh, to come out of this event is the other. Well, there were several medals of honor. I mean, we're only going to feature two, but but these two specifically are pretty badass. The second guy, I have a personal uh, soft spot in my heart for because my wife is a dentist. Yes. And when I read her this, she was like, wow, that's really awesome. That's one of my people. I said, yeah. and this is this is a this is cut this is a cut above here. This is a little yeah. bit different. Yeah, but he was a pretty unusual dentist, Seth. You know, we're talking yes, about was. Captain Dr. Ben Salomon, right? Yes, indeed. Indeed. Yeah. He was yeah, a well, dentist he was, by trade. Yeah. But he was the acting battalion surgeon. Uh, right. It's it's not uncommon for dentists to to do basically the triage. An initial treatment and a medical unit that happens a lot actually it happened at the pentagon on 9 11 in fact when i was there but this guy was 29 year old usc grad from la and he'd entered service through the draft not as a dentist but as an infantryman but he showed proficiency with weapons specifically automatic weapons and he received orders commissioning him in the medical corps he initially refused them wanting to stay in the infantry. So that's incredible and yeah. uh, very unusual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when he get when he does, even when he transfers over to the medical corps and he does act as he does fulfill his role as a dentist before he goes over to Saipan, he would volunteer to give training to the infantry on automatic weapons. I mean, this guy's a born badass. He really yeah, is. He's just a different, mm -hmm. different breed of cat. Yeah, for yes, sure. Yes, he is. As the human wave sweeps ever closer to his aid station, Solomon told those who could to get out now. Seconds later, four Japanese entered his aid tent. Solomon immediately grabs a rifle and kills all four of them. He shot one, stabbed two others, and clubbed the fourth to death with the M1 that he grabbed from one of the wounded. He's pissed off. He stomps his way outside and he's heard to be screaming because he thinks that the forward OP had lets, you know, a few random Japanese get into his tent. He has no idea what right. the hell is going on outside. He stomps his way outside to go chew on somebody when he realizes that, hey, man, my unit has been overrun. This is a bad situation. He sticks his head back in the aid tent and told the men who were still in there to take care of themselves as best they could. He was going to hold off the Japanese. Uh, man, once outside, wow. Captain Solomon grabs a 1919, that's a Browning 1919A4, and unleashed furious fire on the Japanese charging, now straight at him. At least four separate times, he grabbed the machine gun, displaced to new positions, and opened fire again. Again, trained infantryman, knows what to do with an automatic weapon. Yeah, He performed all of his actions alone and decided to die at his weapon rather than flee towards the rear and potential salvation. When his body was found, he was slumped over the weapon with 98 dead Japanese surrounding him. Solomon's body had suffered 76 bullet wounds. Doctors later said that 24 of those wounds had been inflicted before he died. He, too, after a very long and lengthy battle to get him the Blue Ribbon, which he so justly deserved, would finally get the Blue Ribbon in 2002 from President George W. Bush. That is an incredible story. I'm sorry. That's it's just unbelievable. Sad that it took that long. It just he didn't have an advocate, right? Being a dentist, and it's. I wish I could tell you, bureaucracy wasn't a, at play in matters yeah. like this, but it is. Yeah, yeah. It, it, sure. it is, and he did have an advocate to a to a point, and it was the U. Believe it or not, it was the USC Medical School, USC School of Dentistry, actually, were were his advocate, and they were the ones that wound up finally getting it pushed through. But it was years and years later. The reason that mm -hmm. he didn't get it initially was General Griner even said he's like, this guy deserves it. But he was adhering to the rules of the Geneva Convention that said that medical officers could not wield weapons in a battle. That's right. what the they Geneva Convention said. Non-combatants, right. exactly. There was a loophole found later, and I want to say in the 60s, somebody can somebody will tell me otherwise, that said that. They could indeed wield weapons if their patients were under direct threat, which yeah, they, most they, were. Were. they most certainly were. Yeah. So it took them yeah. long enough, but Solomon does eventually get his nation's highest honor, and he very, very, very much deserves it. Yeah, well deserved. 
So there's a myth I want to dispel right now. And God love the Corps. You know, God love the Marine Corps. But there has been a myth for years. And I used to hear it at the World War II Museum from staff that said, well, you know, the Japanese final bonsai charge on Saipan was stopped by the Marines. Nope. It most certainly was not. The 10th Marines were overrun just as fast as the 105th Infantry were. The 10th Marines did indeed turn their 105s down, and they started shooting into the mass of people with their 105s. They indeed did knock out one of the Japanese tanks, and they fought just as bravely as everybody else. But the Marine Corps most certainly did not stop Dikiokusai. Actually, and guys, y'all can comment on this too, nobody stopped the Gyokusai. The Gyokusai kind of stopped itself, didn't it? Yeah, well, you know, you think about what's going on here. I mean, these people are just running flat out at a charge. Um, it's exhausting, right? You're doing this in the in the, the early morning hours on a beach. I don't know how many of you have taken a run on a beach, but that's not particularly easy to do. So the bottom line is that you know, the Japanese are in heavy combat and just the momentum of this thing, just human physically cannot continue indefinitely. People just, you know, start to run out of steam. Um, a lot of them have been killed, but eventually, you know, having made it through and overrun the, the Marine uh, artillery battalion as well, they're kind of out in space at this point too. There's no more immediate targets of opportunity. And yeah, think they just... They're exhausted and they just kind of stop. Yeah. It just peters no, out. And they're also attrited, right? So heavily. The further they get into this, the fewer of them all there are. And For sure. So, yeah. Yeah. So in, in in reference to the 10th Marines, God bless them. They were shooting their 105s. They'd cut the fuses on their rounds to direct four fire. tenths of a second. Yeah, direct fire. I mean, yeah. literally pointed the barrels down at the charging Japanese, cut the fuses on their shells to four tenths of a second and let it fly. Yeah. And I mean, they did the best they could, but they too were overrun. They were ordered to actually retreat, but there weren't very many of them to retreat by that time. And what few could did get out. Um, once their position is overrun, General Griner realizes that more than likely his first and second battalion had been wiped out. And truth be told, they had. He also got word, and this is proof, in, at least in my book, that he never even knew the Marines were there. He got word that Marine artillery, that the Marine artillery battalion had also been overrun. Wary of the Japanese potential to turn those 105s on his own position, he did not know that the Marines threw the breach blocks out. Regardless of this, he, you know, he, he's got to do something. They have to recapture that artillery position. He orders the second battalion of the 106th under Major O'Hara, who we mentioned before in another and uh, last week's episode, to advance and retake the guns. And this Immediately. is late. Yeah, now, like not tomorrow, now. like right now. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. And this is something that has plagued the 27th Division since they landed on Saipan. O'Hara initially tells Griner. The commanding general, it's going to take me a little while. I, he, he said, he said uh, to quote him, it'll take him quite some time, unquote. Griner immediately cuts him off and orders, you will attack at once in any formation you deem advisable with the mission of recapturing the Japanese-held artillery positions. Even at that, it took O'Hara over an hour to get his people moving. Yeah. And this, this is not exactly a fire breather. No. Yeah. It, this is something that blows my mind. You know, we talked about the when you 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 cannot possibly not have heard what is happening exactly. <laughs> You're left <laughs> blank at this point. You know how how mm. is it that you are still a slumber? You know your your yeah. battalion should already be crouched in their holes and ready to go as it is. And no, it, this is this is un unpardonable. I, I yeah, understand. Is, put it in perspective. You know, as it says, to put it in perspective, this is death by fire, death by ice, right? Because yeah. he, he's worried that if he doesn't organize appropriately for the attack, his units are going to be wiped out. His unit's going to be wiped out. If those artillery pieces are turned around, his unit's going to be wiped out. So one way or the other, you know, and, and a whole lot more. So, I mean, this is um, – you try to find a way to make this excusable, and I, I, can't, I can't figure it out. Yeah, it's pretty tough to pretty tough to countenance. And as as we said earlier, the Gyokusai was never actually stopped. It just kind of petered out. When when the Japanese did not have 
frankly, any more people to continue the run. And that's what it was, was a run. It just kind of died out. Uh, the 27th, 106th Infantry Regiment eventually does move into the area and begins to retake areas that had been overrun. But this is like but late not until late afternoon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this yeah. thing has been going on for the better part of eight hours at this point or more. Yeah. Um, holy Magilla. Yeah. Well, that, that that's exact. That's a good segue into what I was going to what I was going to bring up is that. You know, when you think of like Tenaru River, you know, granted that fight lasted all night, but yeah. the Japanese only mm -hmm. charged across that river four or Ooh, five three. times. Yeah, yeah, right. A couple, three you times. Know? Yeah, something like yeah. that. And then and a flanking maneuver through the surf and, you know, all that right. kind of stuff. And Dave right. Holland would have the exact number of times they tried it. But anyway, would, yeah, yeah but, he absolutely would. But, but there's a firefight that ensues there when the Japanese tie up in the coconut, uh, coconut log area and then and then the marines are on the other side and they're going back and forth that you know that's fine this attack goes on all damn day long right. and the fact that well, the huh? only people Just... seemingly cognizant of it are the 105th and the 410th marines yeah blows my mind yeah Mm -hmm. Well, and, and to that point, too, Holland Smith as well seems to be just completely oblivious as to what is going on here. Uh, yeah, until well into the afternoon. Just mind boggling. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, wasn't Smith making plans for a victory celebration while all this is going on? Yeah. Yes. Yes, he was. Yeah. He's Clues. at his headquarters in Charon Kanoa. He has no earthly clue that anything's going on. No. Right. Right. News correspondents, of one of which was Robert Sherrod, uh, attending a briefing at 0830, only heard that one battery of Marine artillery had been overrun, but the situation was under control. Uh, the situation was most certainly not under control at 0830. As a matter of fact, it was like at its peak at that point. Yeah. Um, this is just another example of Holland Smith's complete detachment from the reality of the situation on Saipan here. I, yeah. it's, it's inexcusable, frankly. Yeah, and again, you know, yeah. given the compressed nature of this battlefield, it's not like this is going on, you know, 20 miles to his front. It's going on two miles to his front, and yeah, maybe right. four. Um, this is not a big island. This island is 15 miles long in the end. You know, it's, it's and, and likewise, how could Holland Smith not have heard what was going on, you know, up the beach a, a couple three miles it, it it kind of beggars the imagination it really does yeah uh, i mean I, it's, I it's three it. miles from makushna makusha to marpi and right. you know, of course they run they've overrun makusha at this point but yeah. you know we're talking about this is the center of gravity of all the american forces and yeah. nobody knows it's happening yeah yeah he's in garapan and yeah just clueless anyway he once he finally grasps the situation, he sends the second Marine Division to go through the 27th lines to clean up the mess. Uh, it was at this point that yet again, Holland Smith takes a shot at the 27th claiming, quote, they're yellow, unquote, again, completely and utterly out of touch with reality here. And unfortunately, this is going to end up in American newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the American press is going to take the Marine Corps side on this whole thing and paint the 105th in, or the, uh, the 27th Infantry Division as a bunch of cowards. And, uh, you know, again, having traveled with uh, a woman whose father had fought in the 105th and had been on Saipan, and she told me that, you know, when those newspaper articles came out, it was just... It, absolutely enraging to them, you know, having been on the receiving end of the largest bonsai attack during the war and just getting absolutely crushed by it. And then, you know, and in the process of that, they are going to be handing out multiple medals of honor to uh, members of, of the 27th ID and yet to be branded in the papers as, as being cowards. That's pretty tough to swallow. Yeah, it is. And it all stems from the top, though. It all comes from right. the top. Yeah. So, so eventually the 2nd Marine Division does catch up with the 106th later that evening. Um, for all intents and purposes, the, it, it's over with. Uh, the 2nd Division and the 106th form online. They form a massive skirmish. There's footage of this. I'll show this. They form literally a massive skirmish line, like Civil War style. Shoulder to shoulder. Bayonets. Just yeah. up, up the beach and 
and frankly shoot or bayonet any Japanese that shows any sign of life whatsoever, unless the ones, you know, now is your last chance to surrender uh, as the skirmish line comes up that beach. Yep. There was a quote from a Marine, and I do not remember his name. I remember hearing this when I was working at World War II. He said, and I quote, they were told, if it doesn't stink, stick it. Yep, because <sighs> they've been on the receiving end of too many dirty tricks, uh, you know, mm -hmm. throughout this war. You know, somebody playing possum and pretending to be dead and then, you know, pulling the pin on a grenade and taking themselves and you out with them. Yeah. So, yeah, they're they're not taking any chances. Bill, give One us the, the butcher's bill. Oh, I'm sorry, John, go ahead. No, go, go. I was, I was going to say, Bill, give us the butcher's bill. What's uh, what's the final tally here? Yeah, I mean, there's mass, there's massive masses of decomposing bodies on both sides at this point, American and Japanese. So there's a lot that does stink. They lay across the plain near um, Tanapag right here. Let me show you. It's the Tanapag is right here. There's this plain in this yeah. area here. So, I mean, that whole area has got, you know, hundreds of bodies laying out. Then they've got, you know, uh, the approximately 1,200 soldiers dug into uh, Makushina at dusk. The previous night, 406 are dead, and a, fourth or a further 512 had been wounded. Yeah, the 10th Marines lost, you know, pretty much everybody to casualty. 45 dead, 82 wounded. That's the artillery folks. Um, the Rich Frank, you, you were going to say something about what something that's yeah, um, you know, it's to you, yeah. John. Yeah, it was interesting, you know, Rich, Rich, having, of course, read the the official, you know, the Marine Corps history and the Army uh, history, you know, made a point on a couple of the trips that I've done with him as my co-historian. It's like, it's interesting looking at how the Army portrays this incident and the Marines do. The Army tries to kind of downplay it, whereas the Marines actually are more complimentary of uh, the army battalions in this action than the army history is the, the the marine corps recognized what an incredibly stiff fight this was and, and a completely unprecedented one too uh, in terms of just having you know rolled over those two battalions of the 105th i mean the, that regiment is essentially destroyed at the end of this oh, yeah. uh, the end of this action but guys was, no, is that no, common no. i mean does the army generally downplay in their history or I think this... that just, again, given the dynamics, you've already got the whole Smith versus Smith thing going on. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if that ended up coloring uh, their histories or not. Uh, generally, I find the green meanies are still extremely valuable and generally very even handed. But it was it's just interesting that the the Marine Corps up up voted. Uh, the valor of the, of the army units in this particular instance and recognized just what a stiff fight they had had on their hands. That, that means have, that Holly Smith's fingerprints must not be have been on that Marine Corps history. Correct. So being an employee of the United States Army, I have an opinion on that. So okay. the green books, the, the, green, the green books are an invaluable resource. I mean, that's that's the go to, you know, it's like it's the Morrison of of, of the army, frankly. And uh, or even more so, um, yeah. they paint and a lot of the figures and facts and everything that I represented in the last episode we did on Saipan, where we really talk about, you know, Death Valley and the 27th and how poorly they perform. That came directly from the United States Army. I think, and this is just my opinion from having read them, read this particular portion cover to cover, is that the Army recognized that, I'm sorry to say, that the 27th, for most part, did not perform as they had wished they would have right and, and i'm not saying that they're saying oh well you know you you didn't do good so we're never going to talk about you or anything like that but i think it was more of a long more along the lines of you know they were keeping with the story as it had flowed you know from right. start to finish on saipan whereas the marine corps felt that and this is post post world war ii this is post saipan that they found they kind of felt guilty because holland smith was a dick and yeah. they were trying to show that the army Yes, there were some significant lapses in leadership when it came to the 27th Division from, from Ralph Smith all the way down to his battalion and regimental commanders. We pointed that out. We're no, no, yeah. no need to get into it again. But by and large, your average dog face, your average GI was 
just as heroic and hardcore as any Marine was in the second and fourth division. So, right. and I think the Marines recognize that after the fact, and they're pouring the praise on the 27th in this particular aspect because it's rightly deserved. Right. You know, these guys were hit with something. There's no way in hell they could have stopped that. I don't care. I don't care if it's this whole, if it's the second Marine division up there or the 27th division, it doesn't matter. You're not stopping four or 5,000 people running at you. Yeah. Not unless you were firing time on target missions since about noon, you know, to right. break up that concentration before it actually ever happened. Right. So with, right. and without proper intelligence and targeting, they were never going to make that happen. So, right. Mm-hmm. Anyway. So to, to the, to the Holland Smith, you know, and we're going to, I'm going to continue to throw it on him here. He says his intelligence people or lack thereof claimed that between four and 500, four and 500, Japanese were involved in the attack. It's I don't really know how they came up with that number. I don't know if they were smoking something behind the lines. Or well, what. again, and this this is an instance of Holland Smith never went to the front. Holland nope. Smith never walked the battlefield. Holland Smith never saw the thousands of corpses that would have been you know scattered all up and down that beach. I've seen pictures of them. You know, um, again, Holland Smith was not a leader of men. Holland Smith didn't lead from the front, so Holland Smith didn't know what the heck he was talking about. Not didn't didn't Nimitz and Spruance eventually come ashore here in Saipan and survey mm. this? Battlefield? Not right now. Not right yeah, now. I don't. I don't think so. Um, okay, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. So anyway, he to Holland Smith's complete and utter failure here. He says four or five hundred Japanese attacked. Well, the body count says something completely different. The actual death toll on the Japanese side was absolutely astonishing. And there's the numbers seem pretty precise, but I think they're rather off, frankly. 4,311 Japanese died during the Gilkasai. Well over 2,000 of those dead were behind American lines. That's a lot of people breaking your lines right there. Yeah, they were Mm -hmm. just completely flattened. So, And and I I wonder about those numbers, too, because among other things, you know, are you counting the kid that was in this thing? Are you counting the women that you're finding here as part of the, I, you know, I have no idea how they, how they break that body count down because they don't, you know? No. And so, yeah, the toll might've even been greater than that uh, when all was said and done. And of course, in the course of any combat, there's always going to be missing as well. I'm, I'm sure. that's gotta be an undercount would be my guess. I, I... I, I strongly agree. Yeah, yeah. I, I strongly agree. I, I think, you know, I mean, I, I'm not going to put a number on it because I don't know. I'm not, you know, I don't yeah. have a crystal ball. But I would agree that, I mean, geez, just from the artillery firing alone, the 10th Marines blowing holes in the Japanese at 105s. I mean, you're going to eviscerate people. You're going to vaporize <laughs> 300 gonna guys. Yeah. yeah, maybe. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, there's maybe there's like, a lot of dead that were never counted. Right. Mm-hmm. With organized resistance at an end, finally, the 4th Marine Division pushes all the way to the north at Marpy Point, closing the noose, so to speak. On July the 9th, Kelly Turner declares Saipan secure. Yet, unfortunately, gentlemen, the dying on Saipan is not over. And if you thought the Gyokusai was madness, just wait. (sighs) On the morning of July the 10th, with the battle supposedly over, Marines from the 4th Division, interpreters mostly, spent a great amount of time trying to coax civilians out of caves and crevices in and around Marpy Point. Now, you will remember from the last episode, again, we said that the Marines had specifically, the 4th Marine Division specifically, had noticed that there was, the civilian population was noticeably absent. They had captured several hundred, but they were like, I know there's a lot more people here. Where the hell are they? You know, where'd they go? Well, there's only one place they can go to your point, John, which you said about a half hour ago is, you know, we're, they can only go so far. And they're, they're all crammed point. into the northern part of this island, which is extremely, uh, extremely hilly. Uh, in fact, about a about a half mile before the very end of the island, there's this enormous towering 500 foot hill that kind of looks over uh, the, the final end part of the island here. And, yeah, they're all stuck in the forests that are around that ridge line and hill mm-hmm. and these these people are absolutely petrified 
of, of the American starving forces. too. I mean, yeah, the, the situation is nightmarish for them. They've been on the receiving end of the same American firepower that's wiped out Saito's army beforehand. So there's a lot of wounded, starving, disoriented, exhausted civilians uh, mm -hmm. up in this neck of the woods, and it's going to show. One of these guys that was up there trying to coax some of these Japanese out of these holes, crevices, caves, what have you, was a gentleman by the name of Bob Sheeks, S-H-E-E-K-S, Sheeks, had spent the better part of an hour trying to coax what he thought were several Japanese soldiers from a hole. He could hear murmurs and then an explosion when the grenade went off. However many people were in that hole were now dead, clearly. As Sheiks makes his way back towards his Jeep, he could clearly hear several grenade detonations all around him. And these are more than likely what is left of the Gyokosai. Maybe some of those people who didn't decide to, you know, make the charge or couldn't. I don't know. They're pulling pins on grenades and they're killing themselves. He heard some Marines shouting not far away. Fearing a Japanese attack, as he rightfully should, he grabs his rifle and runs towards the cluster of voices. When he gets to that point, he sees several Marines standing upright. Clearly, there's no threat around. And he realizes, okay, well, I don't know what the hell is going on here, but it is what it is. He gets to the edge of this cliff and he looks around. When he does so, the cliff gives this gorgeous view of the surrounding ocean. And I've been in that Roughly same position. I know exactly what he's talking about. And you literally you think you could see the end of the earth from here because it's just this high point. The, okay. the, the cliffs there, the, the cliffs there and the sea there are the most incredible, almost luminous, deep cobalt blue because the water gets deep very, very quickly. It's it's and it's mm -hmm. it's just astonishingly beautiful at the northern end there of the island and the cliffs are very dramatic too and so you've got again this contrast between the physical beauty of the place and what's going on here um yeah i was really blown away by that uh, the first time i went to the cliffs yeah it's it's so, it's gorgeous gorgeous yeah. place bill you were going to say something no i was saying all three of us have been to this place and yeah i was going to say the same thing about how lovely it is and then you have to remember what happened here right yeah yeah. So anyway, back to Sheik's. Yeah. You know, standing around with that group of Marines, and and one of them says, "Oh, there goes another one," mm -hmm. and it's uh, a woman running to the edge of the cliffs and then running over the edge and jumping to her death down in the waters below. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he doesn't. You know, this has got to be something completely and utter foreign. It's not got to be. It is. It's something completely it and utter mm -hmm. foreign to anything that these Marines, and these are the Marines, these are the 4th Marine Division that are up here. There are no, I mean, there may have been a soldier here or there, but but this is 4th Marine Division territory. This is something that they've never fathomed before in their lives, you know, expecting to see something like this. Sheiks is staring there, standing there, and he had to be, he was dumbstruck when, when he sees this woman just over the side of the cliff. About 200 yards away, he watched as another woman walked out towards the edge with three children in tow. One by one, the woman throws the children over the cliff, turned and looked toward the Marines, and jumped over the cliff as well. Yeah, It's hard to explain this. I mean, it's, it's yeah. so foreign to our minds now. You know, even, I don't know, I... I I'm not at a loss for words very often, but I'm frankly at a loss for words. No. I'll be honest with you. Yeah. Well, there's a little video of, of at least one woman jumping. Yes. And yeah. what strikes me is how calm she is. Like she's going for a stroll and then she just steps over the side of the cliff to her death. Yeah. 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 The first time I was ever, um, ever at the cliffs, uh, you know, we've got a tour group. We pulled a bus in. And um, as you know, there's that there's a line of monuments that what to what happened here, you know, that sort of stalk the, the lip of the cliff and uh, they're Japanese, American, Marianne and et cetera, et cetera, Korean as well. We pull the bus in and the place is mobbed with tourists. I'm in the front of the bus. I look out the front window and the first person I see there is this little Chinese girl. She's like five. And she's in this pink poofy dress 
and she's got those little LED uh, sandals on and she is skipping along the line of those monuments and just the, you know, the juxtaposition of her innocence with what happened to those cliffs. You know, I've never been able to forget her. And you think about all the little girls, you know, who never made it, you know, off of that place alive. It just place freaks me out. The, the Japanese send a Shinto priest every year uh, to perform rites there because they say the spirits are not quiet. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, they're really not. You know, I'm not a an overtly uh, religious or spiritual guy, but that place just, it's haunted. You can feel yeah. it. So, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, anyway. no, there's no, no, no doubt about that, you know, and, and the natural tendency and I, the natural tendency of American servicemen, especially in World War II, to be kind to civilians. And I mean, there's, I'm not, you know, there's footage of this kind of stuff, you know, Marines picking up little babies and carrying them, sure. feeding them. And, you know, you know, I mean, yeah. it's, it, it's true. It's, it's all there that the natural tendency of young men, you no, know, no matter how hard they are to see this, they want to do something. And unfortunately, more yeah, often than not, when they, do. yeah, and more often than not, when they try to do something, it backfires. Like the Japanese, they don't, you know, they clearly don't want the Americans there. And if the Marine tries to run and go save a mother and a child, they turn on the jets and they're over the cliff. And, you know, and then there's, you know, Bob Sheik standing there going, what the shit did I just do? Right. You know, what did I just see here? Like, yeah. We do manage to pull. To... Go ahead. There, there are people trying to shoot the Marines to yeah. keep them from saving the civilians. Yes. Yeah. There are still isolated Japanese snipers in this area. The Marines are witnessing things like families pulling a pin on a hand grenade and tossing the grenade around between them until it finally detonates and kills them. Um, yeah. It's just, it's a horror show. And, uh, mm -hmm. We do manage to pull some people out of the surf, uh, but I remember reading accounts from some of the the Marine Corps um, uh, drivers of these of these landing craft that you know, as the coxswain is trying to maneuver this craft in to get to a person who's you know in the water that they can see is alive. You're running over the bobbing corpses of the other people that have already died in this place and chewing them up in your propellers and what have you. And it's just. Yeah, it's a horror show up top. It's a horror show in the water. Uh, and we're unfortunately unable to save very many of these people at all. Yeah. A few of them who were about to be saved then drowned themselves. They went underwater never to be seen again right. uh, as the boat was approaching to save them. Right. And this is lunacy. Yeah. yeah. And, and we should mention, too, that there's actually two sets of suicide cliffs. The, there's right. the set here by the sea. But inland, as I said, there's this big hill that's got a... Uh, I just measured it this morning, actually. It's about a 400-foot high. It's this grim, foreboding gray wall. And so hundreds of civilians are throwing themselves off of the top of that thing as well throughout this day. And there's another contingent of, of Marines up there that are trying to talk them down off the hill. So, yeah, the you know, the northern part of Mariana or of uh, Saipan at this point has just turned into this, this circus of death. Um, yeah. that goes on all day long. And I could give countless examples. And I, I'm frankly, I don't want, I'm tired of it. I don't feel like doing it anymore, <laughs> but I want to tell yeah. one last story from a guy that I knew, John, you knew him too, Keith Renstrom. Yep. Um, we talked about Renstrom in the first episode we did on Saipan when the Japanese launched their counterattack and they use civilians as human shields and he takes possession of a little girl in his foxhole that night. Now, to give yep. a little, and the little girl didn't want to leave him the next morning. Rinstrom keeps that little that little girl safe all all night long. To give a little background on Keith Rinstrom, he was a gunnery sergeant, Fourth Marine Division. He had joined the Marine Corps in 1940. Um, he was with uh, the the contingent of Marines that were in Iceland, you know, in, in prior right. to World War II. So, I mean, he he yeah. he'd been around, you know, he'd been around. Um, he'd done Roy no more. And then earlier in the, in the, in the, in the campaign or earlier in the war in the Marshall islands and then Saipan, and he goes over to Tinian and he eventually goes over to Iwo Jima, which is where I met him. Um, but regardless of this, um, Keith Renstrom is a hardcore individual. He was a Mormon. He was uh, LDS church of Latter-day Saints. He was devout. Um, 
but he believed fully that his job was to kill the enemy. He was over there. He joined the United States Marine Corps to kill the enemy, and that's exactly what he was there to do. However, even a uh, man as hard as Rindstrom was, and, and he was a great guy, absolutely fantastic individual, but at this point, his job is to kill. And even as hard as he was, this boggled his mind. There was one instance where he talked about, and I'll never forget it, as long as I live, he was watching, he walked up to the edge of the cliff, just like everybody else did. And he watched this Japanese man come out of a cave or a hole or something with an entire family, you know, several children and his wife. And he just watched as the the soldier or, or the Japanese man took his little boy who was clinging to his leg because the little boy knew it was coming. Right. And he didn't and he didn't want that to occur. And the, the Japanese man grabbed the little boy, ripped him off his leg and threw him over the over the side and uh, pushed the other kids over the side and threw him over the side one by one. And then he and his wife bowed to each other and then she hesitated and he pushed her and then he jumped over his side as well. The whole family dies except for the man. He gets into the water and he's swimming around down there. And Rindstrom said he was just frozen solid. He couldn't, Rindstrom was frozen solid. He didn't know what to do. He'd never seen anything like this before. And he raised his Thompson to shoot the guy in the water. And one of his Marines says, I'll get him for you, Gunny. And he raised his M1 and he one shot, bam, and he killed the guy. And I remember he looked at me in the eyes and he told me, he says, you know, he says, I thought about this every day of my life. If I had shot that son of a bitch when I saw him, I could have saved that entire family. Maybe. 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 But in his yeah. eyes, it would have. And that clearly right. that stayed with him forever. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It, there's it, a lot of Marines that walk out of this thing with uh, serious PTSD and obviously too. Uh, the sites that they're witnessing here raise awful implications for what this war is going to be if it ends up in the Japanese home islands itself. And we're going to be talking about that, I know, as as the, the program continues and we wind sure. our way through Okinawa. But again, this is the first indication that the Americans have as to just what it's going to be like to fight the Japanese on their own home turf and the awful uh, toll that is going to be extracted from the civilian population there. Yeah. And, you know, I know we're going to get the question asked how many civilians jumped. I don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody, Nobody will knows. ever know. And again, mm -hmm. between the Hundreds. two cliffs, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's probably single digit thousands, thousands. Um, yeah. You know, the bottom line is that uh, the, Pre-battle population on the island was supposed to be around 25,000 civilians, although we also don't know how many of them may have made it off in ships uh, back home before that happens. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, the Americans say that they have just over 9,000 Japanese in captivity, which would suggest that, you know, over 15,000 of them were killed either in this last gasp. Uh, suicide attack or just in the course of the of the combat that led to this point but yeah you you've lost easily 50 percent of the civilian population and maybe nudging up towards two-thirds yeah. yeah and that's just the civilians and you got thirty thousand japanese military that are also killed right um, yeah they took about 97 97 percent kia uh, a number mm -hmm. of the Koreans uh, surrendered, but yeah, the the actual number of Japanese combatants that surrender is very very low. But getting back so, to your PTSD point, John, you know there have been throughout through all wars, right? In modern times, I'll just limit it to modern times. Um, campaigns, battles where civilians are killed. Yeah, now it's after World War II. Happily, those were isolated pockets where. They, they, my, I won't, none of it's minor, but, you know, Vietnam, Korea, certainly more, more so in Korea than Vietnam, more in Vietnam than Afghanistan. And so that's the whole business of, you know, civilian deaths trending in, the, in a positive direction. Um, we'll see where it ends up in Gaza. Let's set that aside. This was civilian death on an industrial scale witnessed by thousands and thousands of Americans 
who had to bring that home yeah. and deal with that for the next decades of their lives. You know, and, and we talk a lot about PTSD in comb- soldiers returning from uh, Marines, sail- sailors returning from Afghanistan and Iraq these days. It is a, the, the, the horror that, the, I have to say this, the horror that our generation experienced is a tiny fraction of the horror that these folks experienced. And it's important that we remember that context. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because a lot of them are never going to talk about it again either. No. Correct. No. Right. Yeah. No, and certainly and it's not good that people it, are talking it. about it. It's good. Yeah. But these guys never did, and they just went on with their lives. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they if, if they did talk about it, it would if I remember guys telling me after they'd tell me, you know, some horrible nightmare that they would say, Yeah, I'm not gonna sleep for the next week or two because of that. Right. Because you know, mm-hmm. they hadn't talked about it. I remember, I, I'll never forget this. I used to hear it often. You talk to infantrymen, Marine, Army, PTO, ETO, it didn't matter. And, and you know, I always made sure we did the interviews alone, just me right. and the veteran. That was it. Because I didn't want family interference for multitude of reasons. But inevitably, there'd be a wife around the wall or the son around the corner of the room or whatever, listening to dad's war stories or whatever. And I can't tell you how many times I'd pack up, put my crap away and get ready to walk out the door. And those family members who weren't supposed to be there came and told me, you know, I've been married to that man for 60 years or never knew never that. Heard that. Never heard that story. Never, never heard, that. heard that before. Ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a reason for that. So, yeah, you know, go ahead, John. I was just to say, let's wrap this up. Yeah, let's, yeah. Uh, let's, yeah. 3,126 Americans had been killed on Saipan. 13,160 had been wounded and a further 326 were missing. So this was by far to this point, the bloodiest battle of the Pacific War. Fourth Marine, Fourth Marine Division suffers the worst with 966 killed in action, 5,505 wounded, 141 missing for a total of 6612. Second Marine, Second Marine Division, 1,150 killed, 4,914 wounded, 106 missing for a total of 6,170. 27th, 960 killed, 2,493 wounded, 73 missing for a total of 3,526. The 27th suffered easily worst during the Gilkasai of the men who say. had dug in on the night of July 7th from the two battalions. Only 189 answered roll call on July the 9th. Yeah, so those casualties are heavily backloaded uh, mm. and are influenced by that by that final attack in a in a dramatic way. Yep. And on the John, Japanese, take, yeah, yeah, I was just going to say on the Japanese side of the ledger, you've got 30,000 military dead, um, probably 15,000 uh, civilians killed as well. Um, and this is going to have major repercussions inside Japan as well. Um, the Japanese understand fully what the fall of Saipan means, that they are now going to be within range of the B-29 bomber. And they've been aware of the development of this aircraft for years at this point and understand at least roughly what the performance characteristics of this beast are going to be. And they know now that the home islands are going to be coming under aerial bombardment. They're obviously aware of what it is that we can do by 1944 in terms of aerial bombardment. They've seen what's happened in Germany, and they know that that's that's next for them. Um, This leads to the collapse of Hideki Tojo's government. Uh, Up until this point, the emperor has been making signals that he's not terribly happy with the way the war has been going but the fall of saipan gives him the opportunity then to formally make his displeasure known uh to the diet and also to some of the you know the movers and shakers within uh the the japanese government tojo is forced to resign and uh the the number one navy guy uh had also Uh, resigned and been replaced with sort of a puppet, another admiral named Shimada. So Admiral Nagano had had gone, Shimada had taken his place, 
just before Tojo gets pulled down, he tells Shimada, having now lost the Battle of Philippine Sea, which we'll be talking about, Shimada, you're gone too. So the the whole Japanese government collapses at this point, and you know they have to scramble to actually put together a, uh, a new government under uh, uh, a guy named Koiso. Um, the Japanese papers immediately uh, come forth with one of the most candid admissions of the fact that we've lost this battle, you know, that our mm-hmm. garrison on Saipan has been wiped out and it appears that the majority of the Japanese civilians have joined them in, in death as well and start extolling this as this is what civilians should do at the culmination of a battle like this, is they should join uh, the emperor's troops in death because, you know, being captured would be worse than death. And so, you know, we can read the Japan's papers as well as anybody else. And again, this sort of foreboding feeling within the upper American command ranks as to, you know, my God, is this what it's going to be like if we actually have to go ashore in the Japanese islands? This is what it's going to be like for us. Um, That said, uh, I would say that amongst the more perceptive uh, members of the Japanese home island civilians, they they too know the fat is in the fire at this point. Uh, we're going to be on the receiving end of something uh, really, really awful, and there, there's going to be hell to pay. So that's that's kind of what's coming as as a result of of this first, you know, the fall of Saipan, followed by Tinian and Guam. The fall of the Marianas as whole as a whole, I think, is. Uh, probably the most uh, important strategic outcome of any of the campaigns in 1944, um, yeah. because it creates the basis for us to be able to project strategic air power uh, at the Japanese islands, and that's going to eventually win the war for us. And, and on top of that, like you said, the Japanese know that it's come too. It's only a matter of time. And so reinforcing your point, the newspaper headline, Jap- Japanese newspaper headline said, the heroic last moments of our fellow countrymen on Saipan, Sublime, sublimely, women too commit suicide on the rocks in front of the great sun flag. Patriotic essence astounds the world. So can or we... terrifies the world, as the case may be. Yeah, yeah I was going to say yeah. terrifies the world, but, yeah. But we that reinforces the point that this is the way it's going to go until the war is over. Right. Yeah. We're doubling you know, down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Big time. And, and I mean, this, you know, this is a whole nother discussion we could have. And we already kind of had one with Rich Frank on another episode when we talked about this use or the decision to use the nuclear weapons. This directly influences that. This is Absolutely. not the reason we use them, but this is a part no, but, of the reason that we use them. Yeah. You can argue that it's, you know, it's saving lives because they're going to all kill themselves if we don't do this. Sure. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that argument is is very, very valid. So to, to your point about the B-29s coming, uh, the first one arrives on Saipan on October the 12th. That's three months after the end of the fighting. Others arrived at a rate of about three, of f- three to five a day. Until in November, over 120 B-29s were on Saipan alone. That's not counting Tinian and Guam either, by the way. Yep. The first strike against Japan from Saipan occurred on November 24th when 111 B-29s hit the Musashino Aircraft Factory near Tokyo. A little interesting side note that that first plane to take off and lead that mission was a B-29 called Dauntless Dottie. Dauntless Dottie was piloted by a gentleman by the name of Robert K. Morgan. And if anybody knows anything about the ETO, Robert K. Morgan was the pilot of the Memphis Bell. So oh. neat little interesting side note there. So R.K. Morgan led the first strike of American Army Air Force's aircraft from the Marianas against Tokyo on November 24th. Did not know so that. So it is, hellfire is coming. And November 24th is not the... Uh, you know, the fire rates, we're still trying strategic bombing, and that's another episode for another season talking about B-29s over Japan. But believe you me, Jack, the hellfire is certainly coming to Japan in the next few months. 
Gentlemen, this was not uh, a fun topic. I usually have great fun when I talk about these things with you guys. And not that I don't enjoy hanging out with you because I do immensely. And we're going to see each other in a couple of weeks face to face. But this was by far the least fun episode I think we've ever done. And I think you all share that sentiment as well. Yeah, absolutely. I do. Yeah. So, but it's necessary. It, it, it has to be told. Yeah, it is a more appropriate and authentic and um, historically precise representation of what war is like. And that's something else that we should not forget. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Not not just combatants are killed. It's the innocents as well. Yes. So with that very somber note, we want to thank you for listening in on our conversation. Please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of Pacific War Podcast wherever you receive your podcast. Give us a rating and review. We do appreciate it. If you want to watch a video version of this, tune into our YouTube channel called the Unauthorized History of Pacific War Podcast. If you have a question or comment, send us an email at unauthorizedpacificpodcast at gmail.com. Once again, uh, sorry for the heavy content, but it's completely, completely necessary. And I want to say thank you if you hung with us this long. Uh, my name is Seth Parrott, and thanks, as always, for watching. John, thank you, as always, for being here. Next Appreciate time we talk... Here. Next time I next time we talk, I assure you it will be on a little bit more of an uplifting topic than this. Looking forward to it. Yep. Bill, take us home. As uplifting as war can ever be, Seth, uh, but I agree. So if you got through this, hopefully we will see you again next week. <laughs>